<laughs> I'm Sunny Anderson from Food Network's The Kitchen. I am grinding pepper because today I'd love for you to join me and make my sweet glazed butterfly chicken. It's easy. And it's one of my show-stopping recipes. I do it lots when I'm having people over and I just wanna just show off a beautiful bird. Uh, if your team skin, the way I do this bird is just maximization of skin. So um, let's get started. I got some salt and pepper. First thing I'm doing is grinding out some pepper. The reason I'm pre-grinding the pepper now is I'm gonna get my hands all, you know, chickeny and I don't like touching my pepper grinder with chickeny hands. So a little bit of pepper. So I'm gonna add some salt to it. I'm gonna shake it up. Eh, looks pretty good. Maybe a little tiny more. And that's it. All right, so this is good and ready to season up my chicken. Uh, my sweet glazed butterfly chicken. It's so simple. Um, it's just a lot of pantry stuff. And I just made it out of nowhere, but I just thought it would be a really cool thing to do um, to show off for some friends, which is butterflying the chicken. And that's what we're gonna do. Uh, butterflying a chicken, to me, is really um, a really show-stopping presentation. But all it's doing is just pulling out the backbone and flattening it. Now, the cool thing about that, like I said, if your team's skin, you get more skin instead of roasting a chicken, and that bottom of the chicken is kind of like gummy and just like, what are you gonna do with it? Um, plus, it allows you to uh, have a little bit more slather space, and the cook time goes down a little bit. Plus, you can sear. Uh, who's ever seared a whole, like, roasted chicken on its side and stuff like that? So the sides don't get the same browning as the top. This is really going to allow you to have a really beautiful display for your friends, your family, or yourself. So get your chicken. Get it onto your board. I'm going to show you how to do the butterfly. Remember the butterfly? If you're over 40, you remember the butterfly, okay? Uh, they also call this spatchcocking. Um, it's very simple to do. Is anyone laughing over there? Are you laughing at me? Are y'all laughing at me because I did the butterfly? <laughs> Please don't make a gif out of this, okay? Or is it jif? Who knows? Um, here's our bird, okay? Um, now, when I first started butterflying and cooking and spatchcocking and things like that, I got to be honest. I didn't know which side was backbone. I had to really do a whole lot of inspecting to figure it out. But I've got a telltale sign for you to know what part you're going to start cutting on. The tailbone. Look for it. Okay? The tailbone. You're going to hold on to the tailbone. It's going to be kind of like your grip. And it's going to help you actually do what you need to do. So, tailbone right here. I'm holding it. I've got my knife. Are you afraid of a knife? I've got scissors. I'm going to show you how to use both, okay? We're going to get the backbone out. So understand, the backbone is going to run from the neck to the tail. I'm going to hold on. And I'm just going to go to the right of the backbone. And you'll feel it. The knife should be pretty sharp. And then sometimes I'll go and I'll hold that neck and I'll meet it halfway. All right, done. See, that's our backbone right there. Now, turn it around because I'm a lefty and I'm doing things in a right-handed world. You can go back down the other side of the backbone with your knife, but I'm going to show you how easy it is to do with a pair of kitchen shears. Just kind of go in and... That's it. Now, do not throw this out, okay? I have made some delicious gravies with this by just putting it in a pan with a little bit of olive oil, salt, and pepper, getting some fat off of it, adding some flour, a little bit of chicken stock, maybe some thyme, and you're done. Put this in the freezer, okay? This is also really good if you wanna make a stock really fast. Just throw all your bits and pieces into a pot together, your aromatics, like your mirepoix with your carrots, your celery, your onion, and everything else, and it's good to go. So just don't throw this away. We're not done yet, though. We've only done the first part of butterflying and spatchcocking. Now, take a look at this. So this right here, breastbone, it's really important to split it. You see it's already begun to split. Sometimes people will take a knife right in the center and just kind of, not too hard. We don't want to cut it in half. We just want to break it. Just want to break it. Why? It's going to help us flatten it, flatten it. Now, sometimes people like to also go in cut out this breastbone, get the ribs out. 
but I really, really like the ribs in there. Anytime you can leave a bone in the meat that you're cooking, it's gonna provide so much more flavor than if you take it out. So if you can cut around those ribs when you're done, just cut around those ribs, leave them in for the flavor. All right, here we go. I'm gonna get some paper towel, wipe this off, and then I'm gonna hit it with some flavor. Oh no! Don't you hate it when this happens? It's the last one. It's okay, I only need one. All right, come in here, pat it off. Really wanna get it nice and dry. Remember that salt and pepper mixture from before? It's gonna go in. You know, we say sprinkle high because imagine if a cloud were like right over your head, you'd get all the rain but it's up high, so some people get the other rain too, like your neighbors and people across town. So the higher you go, the better and further your sprinkle is. Just think about your hand being a cloud. Okay. All right, now at this point, what I like to do is I like to leave this at room temperature for about two hours for a couple of reasons. A lot of times I'm prepping this straight from the refrigerator. It's not smart to cook a cold chicken. So up to two hours on your countertop is a really good time for your chicken to become room temperature so everything cooks evenly. Also, I like the salt to soak into the skin and the pepper's gonna hold on to the skin a little bit better if you just let it sit and hang out. I'm gonna put this on the back counter and wash my hands. Okay. It's been two hours, right? Let's just pretend we hung out. I don't know. We watched a couple of shows on TV. And now we've got that butterfly bird. Salt, pepper. Now all we got to do is get it into the pan, sear it, and get it into the oven. Speaking of the oven, I'm going to preheat it now to 375 degrees. All right, so now that that is at 375, let's get to cooking. All right, that's my pot for the sauce that you and I are gonna make in a minute. Got my cast iron pan right here, nice and big. Make sure that your chicken can fit into it. If not, just continue to cut this baby in half and you cook it half and half at a time. Put it on a sheet in the oven, okay? Don't let this big pan stop you from cooking. All right, so I'm gonna get my cast iron pan screaming hot, all right? Screaming hot meaning you're not gonna hear it scream. It's just the term we use, but really you're just gonna look for some smoke to start happening. This is a really good time. I like to tell everyone to turn on your ventilation and maybe get a towel ready to do this thing over your fire alarm, you know what I mean? But it's gonna get nice and warm. I'm gonna put some olive oil in. Not too much, we're not frying, we're searing. All right, so I'm gonna get some tongs out because I wash my hands. I don't feel like washing them again. Uh, but feel free to put this into your pan with your fingertips. Who cares, right? So now I'm just waiting. Saying, you know what we're waiting on? We're waiting on the oil to start swirling and looking like it has a completely different personality. It's not just like laying flat in the pan. We're looking for some steam to come up. You know what I'm saying? A little bit of uh, of that oil that's a little burning off. Uh, it's the temperature of the oil. We call it a smoke point. So once it hits that smoke point, it's a really good time to start searing. I'm just gonna hang out. You can hang out too. All right. <clears throat> now you see the oil. Can you see it? Can you see the oil? So it's starting to have slightly a different personality, not completely. You know, it's starting to hang out with other people around the edge. Like, you know, it's clicking up. You know what I mean? It's clicking up. These are the cool kids. Now, I'm gonna use tongs to get this bird into the pan to sear it. Only because I washed my hands, you know. It's an embarrassment of riches when you have two tongs <laughs> that are actually clean. Usually when I'm cooking, one's in the dishwasher or one I gotta scrape some stuff out and get it clean. Just use your hands. I usually pick it up by the leg and put it in or pick it up by the wings and put it in. Another good point, we're gonna sear. Let's put those wings on top so they get seared as well. So they're gonna be on the bottom when we put it in there. It's gonna go skin side down. All right, now, what are we looking for in our cast iron pan here, which I love. Let's talk about a cast iron pan for a second. If you have not invested in one, and the reason I say invest in, we usually talk about investments because those are long-term things. Invest in one. 
This cast iron pan can be in your family for generations if you treat it right. So treating it right means just making sure that you season it. We've got plenty of videos on foodnetwork.com about seasoning your cast iron. Um, and if you just take care of it, don't ever put it in the dishwasher. You don't have to be abrasive. You treat it right. This thing right here is going to be great forever and be nice and nonstick. So you see I got a little bit of a personality going on here, some swirling, some bubbling. I move this oil around a little bit to the center here. You know what I'm saying? Hit the edges. See that smoke that's happening? We've got our vent on. All right, here we go. Go in. Now, when you're putting something into a pan, do it away from you. I literally can't say it enough. There's the moment when the food hits the oil where I literally just close my eyes and I enjoy the sound of the sizzle. Um, I just, it's not just the flavor of food that I love. I love the way it sounds, especially frying. We're not frying, we're searing, but it's kind of like the sister of frying. You know what I'm saying? All right, look at me. All right, so we're searing. We have a couple of things that might not be touching the surface of heat. Let's just make sure that they're touching the surface of heat. So I'm gonna push some of these things down, like the leg. Make sure that happens. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, another good reason why you wanna use cast iron, it conducts heat in a way that no other pan can, which means these sides are just as hot as the, as the bottom is. So when you have something like a chicken that's touching the side here, that's gonna get golden brown too evenly at the same rate that the bottom is, all right? So this is at about a, uh, I got it on high right now to be honest with you. I'm just gonna hang out. This is like a burger. You don't wanna flip it until it's ready to go. You also are not trying to cook this chicken. We're just trying to get some color on it so when we flip it over to the presentation side, it's presentable. Sticky. Sticky, don't flip it. Not sticky? Flip it. Let's make some glaze. You know what I'm saying? Let's do it. That's gonna sear for a second. We can make the glaze now. Remember I got the oven at 375. This is gonna be a two part roast, okay? We're gonna put it in the oven at 375 for about 35 minutes, all right? Pull it out and then we're gonna glaze it, put it back in for about 20 minutes and let that glaze stick in. If you put the glaze in too soon, the sugars are gonna caramelize, become black, and just not the flavor that you want. So you gotta kind of wait to the end. Um, and it's really just about it attaching to that skin of the chicken. All right, so I've got my pot right here. We can kind of start thinking about making the sauce, which means just breaking down some ingredients. Let's do it. All right, let's talk about this. Got some butter. Got a little bit of acid right there, some apple cider vinegar some uh, grained Dijon mustard, some light brown sugar, garlic, a little bit of allspice from the islands, man. A little bit of uh, onion that I'm not gonna chop, I'm gonna grate because I don't want the chop of it all, I just want the flavor and the juice of it all. And some hot sauce, really, really simple. These should be things that you can find in your pantry. You know, what are you buying? Maybe, maybe the allspice, but I feel like I have allspice in my pantry for those holiday dishes. And it always comes in a big jar like this. It's like I'm looking for ways to use it up. Let me give you a quick way as I look at my bird. If you'd like some quick potpourri, you know, a couple tablespoons of allspice, a couple tablespoons of cinnamon, a few little pieces of star anise, put it in a pot of water, boil it, the whole house smells great. I do that for frying chicken. All right, let me just check this really quick before we start breaking down the stuff for our sauce. <laughs> okay, a couple more minutes and it's gonna be ready to flip and then get into the oven. All right, let me take out the things I'm gonna chop down, like the garlic, like the onion. You know, as I tell you to not check your stuff, 
I want to check my stuff. Do you know what I'm saying? So don't think it's so easy for me to tell you, like, let it rest, let it rock. I want to check it, too. It's very hard. Sometimes I'll just set the microwave and I'll say, like, just hold for three minutes, girlfriend. Just, like, please hold. And three minutes seems like forever when you're waiting to sear, but it's really worth it. Get a little bit more of that surface on that leg. Yes. Yes, leg. Are you a dark meat or a white meat? I'm a dark meat. It's juicy. Oh, man, look at that, look at that, look at that. I'm do Don't try this at home. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> oh, yeah. OK. It's time to flip this baby. I can't wait any longer. It's looking good. Again, as you're flipping, you're going to flip away from yourself, not towards yourself. So if anything that splatters wants to splatter, it can hit your backsplash. You know what I'm saying? All right. Legs. Go in. Look at that. Nice and golden. We see we have a little bit of a hot spot. Who cares? We're glazing. This looks good. All right. So the oven's at 375 degrees. I'm turning off my burner. I'm going to get this into the oven. It's going to be there for about 30 minutes, make that glaze, and then we're at the home run. All right, let's make this sauce happen, this glaze happen, this situation of sticky gooeyness, flavorfulness happen. Tongs to the side. All right, I got my garlic cloves, just a couple of them. Now, a lot of times you'll see chefs going this way and they'll just pound it. I like to kind of go in at that dry end, make a half cut and I just start peeling. Helps me get into it. I don't mind taking my time, getting the chaff off. But uh, you know, the produce section, I mean, you can buy a little canister of these completely already chaffed or skinned for you. All right, see how easy that is? Just go in and not all the way through, just halfway through. Peel it back. All right. Now we're going to be grating two things, grating the garlic into our glaze and the onion. Uh, the reason I do it, I just like the flavor. I don't really need the toothiness of it all. Just want to get that flavor. Number one scent of my fingers after cooking is if I'm chopping cilantro. Number two, chopping garlic. All these people wanting solutions to get the garlic scent off? Well, who are you? <laughs> All right, garlic is ready. I'm just going to grate some of this onion, so I'm just going to go in halfway, halfway, and then that helps me kind of after I lob off the top, go in and get that skin off. Sometimes I like taking off that first onion layer because it's just not as yummy and conducive to cooking as the rest of it. Again, pull this to the side. You can make like a stock with this, even with the skin, okay? Don't throw it away. All right, let's get this baby started. Put your pot on the stove, your smallest pot. This isn't a lot of glaze, it's just one bird. I'm gonna start by adding some liquid. A little olive oil. You know what I'm saying? Not a lot, not too much, just enough to saute. Got my garlic, got my onion. Let's start with the onion first. Garlic browns faster than onion does, and the browning of garlic is not always flavorful for people. All right, so I'm just going to grate it on this side. It's like a small onion. If it looks big to you, it's like one of the smaller onions you'll get. Half of that, grate it. And then I just kind of go in with my hand and pull all the other pulp out that didn't make it. So I get every little bit. And then with the garlic, use the smaller holes. I put some olive oil in there. The recipe calls for butter. You can use that as well. And I put a couple of pats of butter in there as well. You got some olive oil around, it's all gonna work. Just need some fat to get these garlic and onion vibes flowing all together. 
again. And then just kind of go in there and get all the good stuff. Don't miss that step. Look at what's going on. Okay. Now, I will put these back here and use them again. Put them into the freezer. Look at that onion pulp. Don't lose it. And get that in there as well. All right, so olive oil, grated onion, grated garlic. I'm gonna add some butter to it. Uh, if you ever find yourself buttering something and it starts to butter brown, add olive oil. If you ever find yourself olive oiling something and it starts to smoke before you want it to, add some butter. They calm each other down and give you a few more minutes to do what you want to do, which is get the flavor out of the onion and the garlic. Yeah, why not? Three tablespoons. Put it in there. All right, I'm going to move this baby around. I'm going to hit this with a little bit of salt. Just a little bit, not too much. I'm going to get this out of the way. Clean as you go. That's what they tell you in culinary school. I never went to culinary school. I like to tell people my culinary school was my phone bill. Uh, when I joined the Air Force at 18, you know, you move out, you go to Korea. It's the first place they shipped me. I made phone calls home. I didn't even know where stuff was in the grocery store sometimes because, you know, when the parents go grocery shopping, shopping you leave the kids at home. If not, your budget's just out of whack, you know, sometimes. So uh, I would call home from Korea. This is like before they had Skype and stuff like that. Before we had like email, this is how old I am. Uh, we would get snail mail. You put a stamp in the corner and you would wait a few weeks for you to get a, a letter. So, you know, I don't have time to wait for a letter to figure out how to make some chicken. You know what I mean? So uh, I always tell people my culinary school tuition was really my phone bill from the 90s. It was so expensive. I was paying that bill off long after I got out of the military. <laughs> All right, everything's starting to bubble here. Let's glaze it up. Now, in order to make a glaze, you're gonna need some kind of sweeten, some kind of sugar. It's like honey or brown sugar. Brown sugar is just white granulated sugar with a little hit of molasses. And dark brown sugar is like a little bit more molasses than light brown sugar. So if you have dark brown, you can use it here. It's not gonna change the flavor profile too much. I think it's really important to pay attention to your light and your dark brown when you're baking because that molasses can come in and bring a lot more moisture than you're ready for. This smells really good. All right, so you've got your brown sugar in. Do you have everything else ready? All your pantry pools? Mm-hmm. Gonna come in here and add in a little bit of ground Dijon mustard. It's gonna go in. Uh, then to that, I'm going to add in some apple cider vinegar. If you have white vinegar, that works just fine. And then to that, a teeny weeny pinch of allspice. Um, we say it all the time uh, when we're cooking. We like to explain things to you. You know, allspice, it's, it's like all spice, but it's just really one spice. It's not a spice blend. Um, and it's like a little berry, um, indigenous of like uh, Jamaica. And just a little, little bit, not too much. Maybe a little bit more, a little dusting. This right here is an eighth of a teaspoon measure. I did like a little bit less than that, just depends. You can kind of taste it and see if you want to amp it up some more. Now, even when I have this right now, this is on like a medium, actually like a simmer, but this is my big burner. You know how you like have a bigger burner at home? It's gonna be a little bit hotter than the other ones. Uh, we've got a nice bubble going on. That's gonna help the glaze happen. Oh, come on, now I need some real hot sauce, you know what I'm saying? Just pour a little bit. Start working it out. And the color's gonna change on you. Oh, it smells so, so, so good. Uh, anytime I put hot sauce and vinegar together, it reminds me of summertime in North Carolina. If you're familiar with uh, all the ways people love to make barbecue, you know, there's the KC barbecue, Kansas City, and, you know, then there's the Southern barbecue, North Carolina barbecue, Texas barbecue. North Carolina barbecue is all about the vinegar. And my granddad would also obviously add hot sauce and other things. This just smells like North Carolina to me. Look at that. A few minutes in and we're done. I'm just gonna turn this off. 
I always say, you know, taste as you go. Make sure you like it. I might have to balance it a bit with a little bit of salt, but I doubt it. I do it with a fork. If I do it with a spoon, I'll be, I'll be tempted to actually drink it, let's be honest. So if I just dip in a fork, get the flavor of it, taste it. Taste what you just did. That came from your pantry. That was simple. Just a few familiar ingredients and you were in glazed heaven. All right, I'm just gonna clean up my mess a bit. I got a few more minutes till I get that chicken out of the oven, glaze it, get it back in, get it out, carve it, eat it. All right, it's been about 30 minutes. Check your bird. Oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Get your phone out and you just take a quick photo so you can show people that you really made it and show them the steps, you know? Yes. Okay. Let's glaze it. Remember the glaze? Very simple. Some hot sauce, some onions, some garlic. Start off with some fat, butter, and oil, or butter and oil, or butter or oil. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say. Some allspice, a little hot sauce, apple cider vinegar. So simple. Look at that. Pepper, a little pinch of salt. You can also just brush it or just give it a nice little, oh, look at that. Oh. Yeah, get it everywhere. Mm-hmm. 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 This is good on grilled pork chops as well. If you like doing a side of salmon on your grill, this is awesome on a side of salmon. The reason I tell you that is, look, based on the size of your bird, you're gonna have a little bit of that glaze left over. Hold on to it. All right, remember, our oven is at 375 degrees. We're gonna get it back in, uncovered, 20 minutes. Okay. Look at that bird. Come on. Look at your bird. It's beautiful. You did that. This is the toughest 20 minutes of my life. You know, this is the time you maybe say, what am I gonna eat with it? <laughs> Mashed potatoes. Uh, you can get some greens out of your freezer, saute them with a little bit of salt, pepper, olive oil, and a squeeze of lemon juice. Um, sometimes I'll just get some fresh corn off the cob, you know, shave it off, put it into a pan with a little bit of garlic, salt, pepper butter, lemon juice again. Have fun with it. You've waited long enough. Let's get this bird out of the oven, carve it up and eat it. Oh. I mean, come on. Look at that beautiful bird. Beautiful bird. Usually I would say, wait a few minutes, let the juices redistribute and all that good stuff. But you and me are hanging out. You know what I'm saying? Permission to carve bird? Granted? Thank you. All right, so let's get this thing onto the cutting board. Big spatula for a big job. Tongs to act as extensions of my hands because the bird is hot and I'm not touching it. So I want you to understand, I do not want you to drop the bird after you've worked so hard on it, okay? First thing in it is to the spatula. That's gonna be a nut, that's gonna be one side, okay? You're gonna come in from the other side and you're gonna see how, see how that goes? See how that goes? We can do this forever. We've got a nice steady platform for it. Okay, get this baby out of the way. Oh, come on. So cute. You don't think that is gonna wow a crowd? I mean, I just don't know. Okay, let's cut into this baby. I usually will go in half. You ready? I'm, can, you ex can you tell? I'm excited. 
So right through the center, right through the center. Now look, I've made this many times before, and once you make it a few times, you'll start to understand how long it's gonna take and kind of touch it, take a look. But let's be safe. Internal, internal thermometer. Uh, you're looking for 165 at the end, but I would argue that it's really smart to take it out at about 155, tint it, and wait for it to come up to 165. What do I mean by tinting? I'll show you. Aluminum foil. You just make a tint. It's gonna hold that heat in. You don't have to worry about crimping or anything. But before that, we gotta make sure it's at that tinting temperature. So you're gonna put your thermometer into the dark meat. Mm, Cause the dark meat takes the longest. Look, I just poked like crazy. <laughs> oh yeah, it's going. now. First thing you want to look for is for the temperature to rise fast. You don't want it to like creep up to 155. You want it to get to 155. All right, and it's there. All right, so because I know that it's 155 on the thigh, I am sure the breast is done. So let's tint and make everything hang out together. Tint, 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 tint. It's done. Okay, so cut into it. We've got one half. Now, if you're living with a hungry man or a woman, I mean, it happens. I don't want to get gender specific here because obviously I'm a hungry person. This is just perfect right here. Just go ahead and put that on the plate and they are happy. A little bit of wild rice right there and whatever your vegetables are next to it, it's picture perfect and ready for the gram. Uh, do you see what just happened? It just slid right off. That's juiciness, baby. That's your leg and your thigh right there. You come right in. Cut your leg and your thigh. They come in. I do a little, a little bang, bang, bang. Get your wing out. You can go in, you can carve your chicken breast. So what I like to do is come in, go along the bone line. Ooh, it's hot. I'm gonna get your breast off. And then you can go in and just make some slices. I say, you know, a little bit less than an inch. It's hot. Cook's treats. Make sure your back is to the family when you do that. They don't need to see that you're having a good time. All right, let's make a plate and let's eat this. Get out of here. Mmm. Mmm. I'm going to tear this up. I want you to just see how juicy this is. Look at that. Look at how juicy that is. Just permission to eat with my hands? Thank you. It's so juicy. If you like barbecue, which is like sweet on your meat with a little bit of tang and that mustard just comes through if you've ever made a gravy where you felt like it needed one more hit of something add some Dijon mustard it's not like it sticks out but it's just hanging around making everything so earthy and flavorful this is juicy the glaze is glazy sticky and shiny look what you did I mean wow is it wrong for me to love my own recipe? <laughs> I hope you love it too. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. I hope you had fun making my sweet glazed butterfly chicken.